there was just times that the presence of God would come into Brownsville and it was pressing, it would press on you. You know, because the glory means the kabod, the weighty presence of God. You could feel it pressing in. Brownsville was not just revival. Yes, it was revival. People called it Brownsville Revival, the Father's Day Outpouring, Pensacola Outpouring. Yes, it was revival, but it was much more than revival. I believe it was a reintroduction to the American Church of the glory of God. It was a reintroduction to the American Church of the glory of God. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. Sitting next to me is my lovely wife, Robin. Hi, everyone. So today we are on our fourth and final installment of our Brownsville Revival we Series. We think it's the final installment. We think it's the final installment. We, there could be more, just to let you know, but we'll <laughs> see how it goes today. Um, today we're going to be talking a bit about the aftermath, what, uh, what the re leaders of the revival are doing now, uh, what was the result of the, of the revival. We're going to be talking about some financial issues. We've got a few clips to play for you and so forth. Sure. We wanted to talk a little bit about testimonies also, what mm -hmm. people said, who went there, um, how it affected their lives. So Danny, I think to start, we have a clip about John Kilpatrick talking about the revival. The Bible said, yes. where wickedness does abound, my grace does much more abound. I want to tell you something. If you're troubled by this, if you're troubled by what you see here tonight, then you've come in and you're looking around and you're saying, oh my, this is horrible. Well, I want to tell you to batten down the hatches because this is about to break out all over America. <laughs> and I want to tell you something else. Listen. The devil has robbed the people of God. We've been robbed. We've come into churches, and we've died when we come into churches because somebody told us to be quiet and act real dead and quiet and icy. And the devil has been snickering under his breath. But I'm going to tell you, God is raising up a generation that has been delivered from great and mighty things. And when they come into churches from now on, it's not going to be quiet and peaceful anymore. It's going to be loud and boisterous and victorious. And God is going to get the glory. Yeah. Listen. Just a moment. We're going to move on in the service, but I want to encourage you. You don't know how good it feels. I used to be one of those. I used to be somebody just like you. And most of the people in this building did. But oh, it feels so good to shake the religion off. And it feels so good to let God be God. And I want to encourage you. Nobody's going to know you. And if they do know you, they already know that you're here anyway. Robin, what are some of the things that stood out to you in that clip? Um, number one, he was talking about how Satan comes in to rob people and we're, you know, the spirit of religion makes us dead and quiet, act dead and quiet in church. And I thought of the verses in the New Testament about how, um, women are instructed to be quiet and submissive in the church. And that's not dead and quiet. It's quiet and submissive. And, mm -hmm. and when we learn, we should be quietly learning. Exactly. Um, and the Bible, and we've mentioned this over and over again in this series especially, that the Bible makes it clear that church is to be orderly. God is a God of order. And you know, Paul made it very, very clear that people aren't to be out of control. What happens if you're out of control? And I know that this is on the issue of tongues, but I think it applies here too. What happens if an outsider walks into the church mm. and everybody's doing gibberish like Paul talks about? Well, they're going to think that Paul says they're going to think you're out of your minds. And that applies here too. What if, you know, outsiders that just happen to come into a church where people are acting disorderly, 
and things look to be in chaos, right? They're going to think, "Wow, what if I got myself into what? Exactly. What in the world did I walk into?" Yeah, and Danny, when Kilpatrick says, you, "I just want to shake the religious off," um, they use this whole religious idea, and in under that umbrella, they refer to everyone who disagrees with them mm -hmm. Any, has a religious spirit. Anyone who criticizes, anyone who looks critically at what's going on and, and, and asks the question, is this really from God? Well, the reason why you're asking that question is because you must have a religious spirit. So shake it off. Yeah. And then you'll fit right in. Absolutely. One of the things we haven't talked about yet is the healings and testimonies of healings, which ran rampant throughout the revival. Um, why don't we start with that article that we found, which is very sad. It's a very sad article. This article is from the Pensacola News Journal, September 20th, 1998. Revival prays to raise an infant from the dead. Doug Fournier did everything he could to keep his six-week-old daughter alive. After she died, he did not stop trying. He packed her body into a picnic cooler, surrounded it with ice, and drove 350 miles from Gainesville to Pensacola. His destination was the Brownsville Assembly of God Church, where he believed Brownsville revival, lead revival leaders could bring his dead daughter back to life. Pastor John Kilpatrick and Van Lane, the revival's children's minister, gathered some staff members around the cooler in the church's sanctuary and began to pray. For at least two hours, they prayed to God to bring Fournier's daughter back to life. Fournier, 31, who lives in rural Hollister, just east of Gainesville, said he attended the revival once for two nights about two years ago. He said his decision to bring his daughter to Pensacola was not because of any claims he had heard from revival leaders. It was strictly between me and God, said Fournier, whose daughter died from complications due to premature birth. Revival leaders have at times talked about the miracle of raising the dead. At least one person, Lane, believed that a major miracle might occur when Fournier arrived about 4 p.m. on June 18th, even though Kilpatrick and Lane had discouraged his visit. My own spirit, there was anticipation. This man was moving on his faith, Lane said. It was a perfect opportunity because the baby was not stable or physically able to live on its own. The fact that the man brought the child, that the child was here, this will happen. It's happening in other parts of the world. Why is it not happening in the United States? Just the fact that the child was here helps me to understand he very well one day may do that. Since its start in June 1995, the revival has attracted several thousand people to each of its four services a week. The revival leaders widely proclaim that the Holy Spirit is present at the revival and that miracles and healings occur there. They also have hinted that more miraculous events can and will occur. And the article goes on. It's important to look at the image in the article, Danny, and it states the death certificate for his baby girl was not enough to keep a father from bringing his child to the Brownsville revival. David Hogan, who has lectured at the revival school, claims on his videotape, Faith to Raise the Dead, that he can bring the deceased back to life. It's really hard for me to believe that the folks, the leaders at Brownsville had David Hogan there. Now, maybe he was different back in the 90s than he is now, but this guy is an absolute fraud. He has claimed to raise over 500 people from the dead. Yes. He's been on Sid Roth uh, several times. Um, That's he's, when he claimed that he died twice in one day because seven <laughs> of his organs had failed. <laughs> he, he's... He's on, uh, you can you can see him, uh, he's connected with Bethel, he's been to Bethel, he's preached at Bethel. This guy is just, he's he's an absolute wackadoodle. And like I said, maybe he was different then. But. Right. And before we go on to other um, claims of healings, I think it's just so sad that something about the Brownsville revival made this man think that he could actually bring his daughter there mm -hmm. and she would be healed. Not and because people at the revival were making such claims and the claiming all of the time that these healings were taking place, maybe not raising from the dead, but healings were taking place. So false hope. Robin, what kind of pastor I, I, would, would allow a man to bring his dead daughter in a cooler in front it's, of... It's very sad. You know, how, how many people... 
and then pray to have that child raised from the dead. I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling that um, you would do, it does remind me a little bit of the baby Olive uh, story from Bethel, where they tried to raise Olive from the dead. There's more cheeky little hugs, and there's more agamagas, and there's more toe rubs, there's more snuggles, there's more television shows, there's more walks, there's more, there's more cookies, there's more candy, there's more mac and cheese, there's more string cheese, the white kind and the orange kind. There's all the kinds, Olive. All the kinds. There's there's no there's more there's more fingernail paint for your fingers and your toes. There's more there's more fake tattoos for your belly, for your leg, for your face, anywhere that you want it, love. Your hair has come back and it needs to grow. We're going to see your long hair, not just your beautiful short pixie hair. We're going to see your long hair in Jesus' name. So we say arise, Olive. We say arise in Jesus' name. We say rise up, Olive. Resurrection power in Jesus' name. But the the fact that and, and listen, we've talked about this in the beginning, and we've had comments. By the way, I just kind of want to, as a side note, we've had comments on our videos, uh, this last one at least, that we're not being fair enough. You know, we're not talking enough about you know all the good things that happened, and we we recognize that there are good things that took place at Brownsville. There was. The, you know, the Bible was open and there was much more preaching than there was at yes. Toronto or Lakeland. Um, and, and there, there was salvations, there was repentance being preached. All of that took place. Um, so yeah, we're trying to be as fair as we mm-hmm. can here, but situations like this kind of gives me, um, the impression that these leaders have no discernment, <sighs> I just can't, I just, it boggles my mind. Yeah. Um, Also, when we're talking about the healings, and there's a couple other brief ones we're going to talk about, um, I would think if I were in a ministry that I claimed was a healing ministry, I would want to start to gather evidence Mm -hmm. and have names and dates and medical records and everything like that to say, this, these are the healings that God did. I didn't do like all of these people say God is doing them through me. So I would want proof Prove that, it. that I'm saying there are healings and I'm showing you that there are actually healings. And that's what we're missing in almost all of these cases. Um, a story, Dave Collins, a charter bus owner from Oklahoma City, told the News Journal that a woman who rode on his bus had brought her, her little daughter she had a rare disease where the foot was turning backwards and the bus driver said, the doctor said that her foot was going to have to be amputated, brought her to the Brownsville revival and she was healed. Well, the problem was they couldn't interview the woman because Collins wouldn't give her name or her address. Um, The church said it did not keep any records of healings. Yeah. So you're kind of at a, okay, are we just going to believe you? Exactly. And you're right. It, it just makes more sense. It's, it's, it makes logical sense that if you can compile the evidence that all of these healings have taken place, it is going to help your cause and help your revival yes. much more than just, you know, empty claims. And unfortunately, that's what a lot, like you said, that's what a lot of these healings uh, were. Yes. One rather amusing story about a woman in Lima, Ohio, who her name was Sandy, and she said she grew a new esophagus at the Brownsville Revival earlier this meeting. Her husband, Clarence, asked the News Journal to not contact the doctors no, about this claim. Yeah, yeah, she did. Don't so contact the doctors. Please don't contact the doctors. Just an amusing side note. There were many, many claims to healing. And again, there's a Dr. Nolan out there who did a book. He had followed Catherine Kuhlman. He um, was just looking for actual healings mm-hmm. and and made note of the fact that so many of these revivals um, bring about in people uh placebo effect yes a desire to be healed a 
feel better effect that actually does help them. It really does. It really does work. The placebo effect is powerful. Um, yeah. Steve Kozar was uh, talking, him and Paulette were doing on one of their uh, Hit the Bars. They were talking about a documentary that Steve had saw where they had taken these young teenage kids and they brought them all separately. And each one of them had serious issues. I can't remember what the issues were, um, but they were some serious issues, debilitating issues that were keeping them from living normal lives. And these group of fake doctors, that's what they were. They were mm -hmm. fake. They uh, told them that they had this new method, this new machine. They were going to put them in this machine. They were going, it, it was guaranteed to, to heal them. And so they did it, and the kids, each one of the kids got better. Mm. There's something very powerful about believing uh, that, um, you know, you're going to get better if something like that happens. The placebo effect is very real, and it does work. Yes, you're right. So another thing we talked about, Danny, really quickly is, so we look to the Bible at the healings in the mm -hmm. Bible and what happens with those. Every person that Jesus healed was immediate. Immediately healed. There was no, um, you know, uh, go home and let's wait and let's see what happens kind of thing. Nope. The apostles mm -hmm. and Christ, when they healed a person, that person was healed immediately completely. and completely, and there was verifiable yes. evidence that the healing took place. And there just isn't any of that yes. today. And we do understand there's the instance where he heals the blind man. And the first time around, he he sees what are like trees. Mm -hmm. And then the second time around, he seals completely. And I, I don't think that's because Jesus... Couldn't do didn't it. Didn't do a good job the first time, <laughs> yeah. so had to finish the job. It was yeah. for a reason. All right. Now, one of the beautiful things about uh, being able to have newspapers.com as mm -hmm. uh, a resource is that we can check out the Pensacola News Journal, news journal articles. They're online. They're, they're, they're all there. So when right. you start doing research into Brownsville... And you start seeing that uh, there was a almost a, a fight between the uh, leaders of the Brownsville Assembly and the Pensacola News Journal. You can go back and you can look and see all of look those all articles. Of it's beautiful. Um, so the revival started in 1995 and Brownsville got a lot of good press, mm -hmm. a lot of positive articles, a lot of good things happening there. In 1997 the Pensacola News Journal started an investigative series on the Brownsville revival and things kind of blew up a little bit. Like what is going on there? Yeah. And as I, uh, as, as we were looking at this and going back and looking at the newspapers, one of the things that we found that we saw to verify that there was good press was from the very beginning that the Pensacola News Journal actually started, you know, um, uh, covering the Brownsville mm -hmm. revival, there really were. I mean, like from 95 all the way up through 97, I didn't see any negative articles no. on the Brownsville revival. Oh, it was all positive, at least from what I, I saw. I'm sure there may have been one. I didn't go through every single article, but there was a lot of positive yes. stuff. So they started this series and it was more investigative, more questions about why is this happening like this? What's going on with this? A few of the topics that um, they discussed. Steve Hill claimed to have been arrested 13 times. Mm -hmm. This was part of his testimony. Yep. The The Pensacola News Journal does its research and finds out in his hometown he was only arrested maybe three or, three four, or four times. times yeah. So they're like, why is there this discrepancy? Now, after we talk about a lot of the articles, Brownsville came out with a response to all of the Pensacola claims and the Pensacola News Journal claims. And some of them were like, okay, that's, that sounds reasonable. And others they could not respond to. Um, there were claims by Brownsville 
that crime had greatly been reduced in Pensacola. And the Pensacola News Journal comes out and says, yeah, that's not true. We have the statistics right here, and it really was not reduced at all. There were a lot of financial discrepancies, and this is one of the things that was was really an issue. Like, where is the money going? Yeah. Um, once the revival started, every one of the leaders created their own organization or ministry outside of the Brownsville revival. Like there was Steve Hill Ministries together in the harvest. Lyndon Cooley had his own ministry. And then there was the John Kilpatrick ministry. And it seems like each one of these ministries was selling merch mm -hmm. that had to do with yeah. the revival. Yeah. And the uh, Pensacola News Journal really just uh, smeared those guys in their article about that, uh, the, the guys selling their merchandise there at the revival. Right. There was an article about a dad who claimed that he took his daughter to the church because they were both very, very hungry and the church wouldn't feed them. So just lots of really negative publicity mm -hmm. coming down. And they actually have a, a church official who said, well, we we try to just take care of our members, like just bad things that happen and that you wish you could take back from saying. So there was a lot of articles like yeah. this. Um, the community really saw very little to no benefit from the revival. Like there was no, the probably hotels benefited because a lot of people came and stayed there. But, but the people in the revival were doing nothing. The church was doing nothing to help the community and the people around them. Um, one of the things that you would expect to see if a revival is genuine is that uh, the community itself would improve. It just kind of reminds me of what you see and hear with even the New Apostolic Reformation folks, how they're going and claiming territories, you know, and casting out demons and this sort of thing, and nothing's getting better. Dominion. Yeah, and yeah. nothing's getting better. Well, folks, things are getting weren't getting better then, and even now things are not getting better like a lot of these uh, people who are screaming for revival are claiming. Yes. So financially— very soon after the revival starts, they are really bringing in a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. So the Brownsville leadership team starts buying up all of the property around the church site in order to grow and build a new chapel um, and do all of this. So they start buying houses from the neighbors and things like that. Um, they bought, Chun Kilpatrick bought a new house in Alabama. Steve Hill bought a house in Alabama, and there's nothing wrong with that other than in Alabama, you don't have to report how much you're paying for your house. So neither man reported how much his house was, was worth. Um, the church bought John Kilpatrick uh, an RV, yeah. one of those big vehicles, mm -hmm. because he didn't like to fly. So they bought him that for over $300,000. And we, in our research, are not claiming that anything was done improperly other than there did not seem to be a lot of financial accountability. Mm. So by the time that the revival was over, Brownsville is $11.5 million in debt and all of the leaders are gone. And that's kind of where it was left at the end. Mm. Back to the articles, Brownsville puts out uh response to all of the negative Pensacola Journal articles, and they really do clean up a lot of what Pensacola was reporting. However, Steve Hill did admit that maybe some of his claims were inflated about his own testimony, yeah. things like that. So that's where that stands. An another event that took place during the 97-98 era was Hank Hanegraaff. Yeah, Hank Hanegraaff uh, put out an article around that time, that uh, claimed that the Brownsville revival was not from God, that it was a false revival. Yes. John Kilpatrick prophesied against Hank Hanegraaff when Hanegraaff um, said what he said. John Kilpatrick said the following, I want to say something this morning to Hank Hanegraaff. You better back off because I'm going to prophesy to you that if you don't and you continue to put your tongue in your mouth on this move of God, within 90 days, the Holy Ghost will bring you down. 
I said, within 90 days, the Holy Ghost will bring you down. And I speak that as a man of God. This is a move of God, and you better leave it alone. Now, Hannah Graff is telling the Pensacola News Journal, whatever I said, he's wildly distorting it and now saying these things about the Holy Spirit. Kilpatrick comes out almost two over two months later and apologizes and says, I wasn't prophesying, but you can go back and see that he was indeed prophesying. Absolutely. It was a prophecy. And folks, that makes John Kilpatrick a false prophet. Right there, uh, John Kilpatrick should have been discredited. You're right. We did not go into great detail about the financial discrepancies. Um, If you want to do research on your own, there's Mm -hmm. just so much material out there. We just wanted to touch on it briefly because it was one of the problems that the leadership did face. Yeah. All right. So let's, um, let's talk about the testimonies there at, uh, at Brownsville, what happened to specific people while they were there. There are some good ones and there are some bad ones. Even on our video, uh, on our videos, we've had people who attended Brownsville and they've had, there was some good experience there and there were some bad experiences uh, that people have had. So let's, let's talk about the testimonies. Talk about a couple of those. Mm -hmm. Um, Number one, claims of people leaving Brownsville because they were unhappy with the revival Mm -hmm. range anywhere from 150 people left. That's what the church claims to 800 people or more left. Why such a wide range? I have no idea. Maybe the Brownsville church was claiming that it was, they were just looking at membership Mm -hmm. and the other article was looking, but it just goes to show you that, especially with Brownsville, you find this range on every topic. Yeah. There were tons of healings. There were no healings. Tons of people left. A few people left. Yeah. So I guess the Pensacola News Journal article said that 800 people or so left mm-hmm. and Brownsville came back. The The leaders of Brownsville came back and said, yeah, no, not that many people left. Uh, what, what did they say? 150 people 150. left or something like that. So, yeah, there's just right. this wide range of, of uh, well, it just gets confusing. It gets confusing. So you kind of just sort through and see mm-hmm. what you can find. We picked a couple of testimonies because they showed both sides of the coin. The first testimony I wanted to talk about was written by J. Lee Grady, who is the contributing editor for Charisma magazine. He was the magazine's editor for 11 years, and he writes the following about Brownsville. My life was changed there. I wept in the carpet and repented for my journalistic cynicism. One night, in the midst of all the pandemonium near the stage, I ran over to where Hill was praying. He grabbed my head and screamed, fire, fire, more, Lord. I was one of the thousands who fell backward on that floor. I was not pretending. I felt as if God had placed a heavy blanket of his presence on top of me. I don't question whether the Holy Spirit was in that place, but today, more than 10 years after the Pensacola outpouring occurred, I am asking other questions. I am wondering why the church that hosted hundreds of thousands of visitors has shrunk to a few hundred members and now owes millions of dollars for a building they can't fill. I'm struggling to understand why so many people who once were part of the Brownsville church now feel hurt and betrayed. I'm wondering if the leaders of this movement mishandled the anointing of God's presence like Yuza when the Ark of God almost toppled on the ground. Mm. So $11 million in, in debt, debt is is what, and we're going to be talking about that in a few minutes, but before we do, I was uh, reading through some of the journal articles this morning. There was a, an article on a guy named Justice, and Justice was a... Uh, homosexual. He was also in the occult. He was a drug addict. And his mother finally convinced him to go to the Brownsville Revival. He goes to the Brownsville Revival. Steve Hill comes over, prays over him. He falls to the floor. The next day, he's in the office with Steve Hill. Steve is counseling him. And um, he goes back to the revival again that next day. Um, He goes up forward and he gets prayed over. Um, He's knocked down again. And that's where he says he was saved. And he says his life changed. His mother gave testimony that his whole life was changed. 
one of the things that we see constantly, I think, in, in I shouldn't say constantly, but we see often Frequently. in these testimonies is people experiencing the manifestation of what's supposed to be the Holy Spirit and they fall on the ground there they they're, they're laying there and they feel like this weight is upon them or God's blanket like uh, was just mm-hmm. read was just uh, you know heavy on them and then they have these experiences of joy and peace but there are people who claim salvation now it's 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 a really confusing thing because I don't I want to give people the benefit of the doubt and say okay maybe they heard yes. the gospel and they repented or whatever before all of that took right. place I don't know but that is not how salvation occurs you don't get saved by um, somebody laying their hands on you and praying over you and then you falling out and feeling peace afterwards right. and thinking okay well there you go I'm forgiven the Bible makes it clear that salvation is something that is given to us through the preaching of the gospel. I've mm-hmm. said this before in the other videos. I'll say it again now. Paul makes it clear that the gospel, Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of salvation for all who believe. In Galatians, Paul talks about hearing the gospel mm. and then you know hearing with faith is what uh is what saves galatians 3 1 through 6 O foolish galatians who has bewitched you it was before your eyes that jesus christ was publicly portrayed as crucified let me ask you only this did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith are you so foolish having begun by the spirit are you now being perfected by the flesh Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? It's not some kind of experience that causes salvation. It is the actual preaching of the gospel itself. So, I do want to give people the benefit of the doubt. I totally understand that sometimes when you're talking, you may mm-hmm. not be telling yeah. the entire story. You may leave something out or something like that. But if a person says that they're saved because they had their hands laid on them and they fell down and they felt this really overwhelming presence, uh, you know, like a weight of God or something, and then they mm-hmm. felt all this peace and joy and they equate that to salvation, I got to question that. Yeah, it's very concerning, and understandably so. Mm. Um, Moving on to another testimony. This is from one of our viewers, Mike. Hi, Mike. Mike. Thank you very much. Um, Mike has emailed us a few times about his experiences at Brownsville, and he Mm -hmm. actually followed John Kilpatrick to um, Kilpatrick's new church. So he had some very interesting insights, and we took some of his testimony and want to share that with you. He writes, my life was a wreck before I went to Brownsville. When I went, I truly repented and it changed my life. I quit drinking and other bad lifestyle choices. I started evangelizing all my unsafe friends and they ran away. Before I went down there, I was almost suicidal. There's no way to tell how many people truly repented at the message of the gospel down there like I did. God had already been working in my life to some degree. When I went to Brownsville, the hearing of the gospel and the hard preaching about sin and the rapture put the fear of God in me. It would be wrong for me not to mention this effect it had on my life. I believe it was God and the gospel message. However, the unrealistic vision they painted in my head of being an apostle or prophet messed me up for a while. It was not a practical way to view the Christian walk. I wasted many years chasing after something that was not attainable. The charismatic illusion is a dangerous thing. Looking back, I can see much error in the movement. What much was based on emotion and experience, they opened up a chapel where they had a 24-7 prayer service. They would just have CDs playing and people would come in and pray. One time I went in there and I saw people looking like they were passed out, kind of like Steve Hill said he saw in London. It was a bizarre scene. I was under so much deception thinking that this was normal Christianity. I remember Kilpatrick would always tell us in the congregation that we were like prophets and apostles that would be called out to do great things and go to the far ends of the earth. 
that we would do great exploits for the kingdom. You know, Danny, Mike also goes on to say that he had been in an accident um, when he was in the Alabama church, Kilpatrick's second church, and he just frequently went hoping and praying for healing because Mm -hmm. this was a huge healing event going on at Kilpatrick's church. So he said it was just so disappointing that, and unrealistic to think that anyone who was um, injured or uh, had a problem could be healed. Yeah, it's it's really sad. Mike, mm. uh, thank you so much for sharing Thanks, your Mike. testimony with us and allowing us to uh, be able to read some of your email here on the, on the program. Thank you, really. Um, yeah, so that that's that's the big thing. You know, you have these promises these grand grandiose promises that are that are delivered to you know from a pastor to his congregation or to people in a revival that they're going to do these great things and you hear that all the time doing great things for yeah. god everybody wants to do something great for god so it's kind of just playing on the person's ego just building their mm-hmm. ego up which it's kind of opposite what the bible says christians are to be we're to be servants of other people in the body of christ we're to kind of you know not be in the spotlight kind of back off and and right. and consider you know others better than ourselves and just all of this the way the christian life seems to portray itself in the new testament is a life of obscurity, not a life of going out and doing great things for God. Um, you can see how the NAR um, doctrines started seeping in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and speaking of NAR doctrines, um, some of the leaders of the Brownsville Revival later on in life got involved with some of the uh, NAR leaders. All right, so let's uh, talk about the leaders of the Brownsville Revival. Where are they at now? What are they doing now? Right. Um, We're going to start with Michael Brown. He went to visit the Brownsville Revival in 1996. And in 1997, he joined up and started the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry in January of that year. So he's got the School of Ministry. I think it started off with 120 students, and it grew to over 1,000 in 1998, really growing. A lot of people, especially after going to the revival, wanted to join the school. Mm -hmm. In the year 2000, everything changed. Um, Brown was fired from the school. And the reason had to do with the fact that they took out a sizable loan from the Assemblies of God. And the Assemblies of God wanted some kind of assurance that they were going to get paid back. Now, Michael Brown was not a member of the Assemblies of God. And they asked him if he would become one so that there would be some kind of accountability that they could rely on. And he refused. They then asked if perhaps John Kilpatrick could be named the executive president of the school with very limited involvement so that they could have that accountability. Again, Michael Brown refused. Um, There was a lot of issues that we're probably not aware of, but that was the main issue that there Mm -hmm. were, they could establish no line of accountability that they were comfortable with so that Michael Brown had to leave. So he left the school. This happened in between semesters, like in December, when all the students had gone home, they found out um, in a letter that their president was no longer there when they came back when they were coming back, there were 10 faculty members and he took eight of them with him, started a new school locally, which eventually moved to, I think, North Carolina. Okay. Yeah. So that's Dr. Michael Brown. What's he doing now, Danny? So Michael Brown has a podcast and a YouTube channel called Ask Dr. Brown. Um, Of course, he's written several books. Probably his most popular book is A Queer Thing Happened to America. Um, he has, um, you know, he's, he's got some good stuff. Like that's a, a really good, solid book on homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's done some, some good things, but he's also done some really disturbing things too. And, um, one of those things recently, Chris Roseboro, Chris Roseboro fighting for the faith did a video 
um, showing Michael Brown's endorsement of Kevin Zadai's book, Power, The Power of Words, or Power Words. I believe that's what the name of the book is. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, you know, relating this here off the cuff, but I'm pretty sure it's called Power Words. And Brown endorsed this, and it is full of heresy. In fact, you can see here, forward by Michael Brown, and I've highlighted in a, a little keynote slide that I put, you know, slides that I put together, some of the things said by Michael Brown about this book. So listen to what he says. If you're looking for a lightweight name it and claim it book, a book that will teach how you can have what you say, then this is not the book for you. If you're looking for a book that will teach you how to align your thoughts and your words and your actions with the Word of God, a book that will help you live a crucified, holy, repentant, yielded, broken, and empowered life in Jesus, a book that will inspire you to take you deeper and higher in the Lord, then this is the book for you. And as you read the scripture-filled pages that follow and put the teachings into practice, your life will be dramatically changed. That is a full-throated endorsement of this book. And yet, from the very first page of it, there is heresy after heresy after heresy after heresy. And so uh, we'll put a link to that video mm -hmm. if you haven't seen it in the YouTube description. It's a, it's a fantastic, uh, really fantastic video. Also, uh, our good friend Steve Kozar also did a really good video that most of you have probably already saw where he, uh, I believe it's called an appeal to Dr. Michael Brown. So we'll put both of those videos in the YouTube description. But that's kind of what Michael Brown is doing right now. He's still out there and he's still... Uh, He's still pretty popular. Yeah, I think he has an online school. Mm -hmm. Also, he no longer has a physical school, but he has an online school. Yeah. Moving on to Steve Hill. Steve Hill had had a ministry called Together in the Harvest Ministries with his wife, Jerry, and you can still click on that website. In the year 2000, Steve Hill left the Brownsville Revival. He felt like the Lord wanted him to plant a church. So he moved to the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas and started the Heartland Family Church. He had been diagnosed with cancer. So in 2012, he actually handed over the reins of the church to another couple. And he passed away in 2014. Very tragically, his son Ryan died months later wow. of a drug overdose. So I can't even imagine the heart ache of his wife, Steve's wife, Jerry, during that. Mm -hmm. Jerry took up the reins of the ministry and is now ministering, and she has a website called Ryan's Hope, which is a an kind of like an overcomers program for people with addiction problems. Mm -hmm. um, so that is Steve Hill. Now, before Steve Hill passed, uh, he was involved with folks from the NAR. So Steve Hill was actually getting involved with guys like, um, well, like C. Peter Wagner, the late C. Peter Wagner. And uh, religion is hanging around the cross. Uh, Christianity is getting on the cross. Okay, religion is, and, and America right now is hanging around the cross. Okay, the, the cross has benefits. Okay, there's great benefits to Christianity, but Jesus got on it. And he talked to his disciples about getting on it. And so uh, revival to me is, is a little bit more, there's a little bit more sacrifice uh, involved in it. What should the message right now be from pastors, from prophets, from evangelists, from, from anyone who's, who's in the ministry or anyone who calls themselves a Christian? What, what should the message be? Well, you and I believe in revival. And I think that one of the keys to revival is Jesus' great commission. I mean, he, he so in, in Matthew, Matthew quotes Jesus as saying uh, to preach the gospel to every creature, and he who believes and is saved will be saved and, um, and who is baptized. And so seeing the numbers of people being saved and baptized and then folded into churches and churches multiplying in a way that they, they multiply so fast that they change society, leads us into Matthew's quote of the Great Commission, where he tells us to make disciples of whole nations. But you're, you're talking radical yeah. stuff. I know. Okay? All right. Very disturbing clip. Steve Hill asked C. Peter Wagner 
who preaches a false gospel of dominion, what the message should be from a pastor, from an evangelist, from a teacher, what should that message be? Well, folks, what do you think that message should be? The gospel, Christ bled and died for sinners. Repent and believe the gospel. And yet, see, Peter Wagner talks about the Great Commission, where Jesus says in uh, Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse uh, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And he talks about uh, that the, we are to change society. Yeah. Because he's all into the dominion theology. Yeah, That's what yeah. That is. Now let me let me say it this way: dominion mandate is another word for the Great Commission. We're used to the word Great Commission, but when you, when you see this, you'll see that taking dominion is uh, the Great Commission. And I'm going to read a verse that everybody knows from Matthew 28:19 and 20, where Jesus here's what Jesus said to his disciples. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, he said make disciples of what? Make disciples of all nations. Nations. That's, that's where people live together. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, geographical members of the United Nations. That doesn't necessarily mean that. It can be a people group within a nation. It can be a province, it can be a city, uh, it, it can be a region. But wherever people are living together in society, that's what uh, in the Greek pantata ethne means. Not, um, not, and it also means nations, like the nation of Canada. I mean, is it, would it, could it be possible that Canada would be a nation counted as a nation, a disciple of Jesus Christ? I think it can. But... The, the, why would you even ask? What should the message of an evangelist be? What should the master of a pastor be? Message of a pastor be? Paul said to the Corinthians, First Corinthians two one and two, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What is the most important thing there? Christ, preaching Christ in him crucified, because that's the only thing that saves. It's the only thing that matters. Um, we're going to move on to Lyndall Cooley, mm -hmm. who left the revival in October of 2003. He is currently the pastor at Grace Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, Cooley and Kilpatrick and Hill were all associated with the Awake America Crusades. So while they were pastoring and while they were speaking at Brownsville and leading at Brownsville and afterwards, they would continue to go across America and speak at these revivals and crusades. And I think primarily to fulfill David Yonggi Cho's um, prophecy that said that revival would start like a match in Pensacola and sweep across America. And Kilpatrick mentions this. Yeah. He does. So we are going to go right on to John Kilpatrick. So here's what I want to leave you with. Don't be surprised if sinners don't start giving you stuff and don't know why in the world they're giving you stuff. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Listen, you said, Brother Kilpatrick, I don't, know if this, I don't know if this can be true or not. Don't be surprised if money starts appearing in your bank account and you don't know how it got there. You can't trace it. You don't know who put it in there. And you might be sitting there saying, well, if the Lord will make windows in heaven, we wouldn't be pouring the first. Just shut your mouth right now. Don't even go there because you won't have it. I'm telling you, and nothing is impossible. God is about, I said God is about to bring wealth to the people of God like you can't imagine. So there's Kilpatrick talking about the great wealth transfer of the new apostolic, it's the new apostolic reformation doctrine that they have. And again, if you want to, you know, you want to learn about that. We've got a whole video on that. 
Right. So while at Brownsville, he started the John Kilpatrick Ministries in 1996. And this was so he could begin his own ministry separate from Brownsville. And he used that to sell merchandise, things like that. That's still going on right now. When he left Brownsville, he told his people that he felt led to um, continue his apostolic ministries and he would still um, wanted to maintain that relationship with Brownsville. And that was in 2003. Three years later, he started a brand new church. So a lot of Brownsville people were got a really upset. upset. With that. Oh, yeah. They were upset with Kilpatrick over that because uh, here he was all of these years with them. And now he's like saying, well, I need to, you know, take a little break and go out and do, you know, you know, continue my ministry outside. Mm-hmm. And then he starts a whole nother church. Yes. Apart from them. Uh, the name of that church is the Church of His Presence. And it is located in Daphne, Alabama. In 2010, he teams up with Nathan Morris, who's the head of Shake the Nations in Great Britain. Morris comes to Kilpatrick's church and they start a new revival called the Bay Revival or the Bay of the Holy Spirit Revival. And this was kind of ongoing for nine months or more. They would have meetings during the week and a number of healings were claimed to have taken place there. One very famous one you can see online, a woman named Delilah, Delilah Knox, who had spent 22 years in a wheelchair begins to walk and they have video clips of that. But folks, whether or not miracles actually took place, we talked about the placebo effect, right? That happens. But even if a an incredible miracle took place at one of these revivals where let's just say somebody mm-hmm. who was actually dead was raised from the dead, they, you know, and, and this could be verified. Even if that took place, it would not mean that these people And this revival is from God, because even Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 that many are going to say to him, didn't we do works in your name? And and didn't we cast out demons in your name? Mighty works. These false prophets, they did miracles. Things actually happened. And yet Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. So whether or not they're true miracles or they're false miracles, if their doctrine does not line up Mm. with Scripture— they are not to be listened to. And folks, that passage is talking about doctrine. When Jesus says, beware of false prophets, and you'll know them by their fruit, that fruit is doctrine. That's not talking about good works. It's talking about doctrine. What do these false teachers do? They are The fruit that they're producing is doctrine false doctrine. And speaking of false teachers and false doctrine, if you go on um, John Kilpatrick's church, the Church of His Presence website, this summer he is having the Glory Conference in July in Daphne, Alabama, at which the main speaker is Benny Hinn. Yeah. Along with a couple of other people. Yeah, and Michael Koulianis, uh, uh, it, it, which is Benny Hinn's nephew, is going to be there. Uh, okay. Yeah, just uh, uh, Lyndall Cooley is going to be there. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a few other speakers. Yeah. So, so, again, when I see that someone is keeping company with Benny Hinn, it's an eyebrow raiser. Oh, big time. It's a big time <laughs> eyebrow raiser. And yep. one thing I wanted to mention, when we mentioned Lyndall Cooley, um, e- even in the last uh, video where we talked about, or the couple, maybe it was a couple of videos before. Anyway, we talked about the leaders of the Brownsville mm-hmm. Revival. We talked about Lyndall Cooley. One of the things that Lyndall, Lyndall Cooley wasn't 100% comfortable with what was taking place at the Brownsville Revival, correct? That, that's true. In Steve Raby's book, which we talked about um, in a previous video, Lyndall mentions that he was very uncomfortable with all of the manifestations mm-hmm. and um was probably the least comfortable of all of the leaders and finally just came to accept that maybe God moves in different ways for different people, but was never a huge proponent of the manifestations. Yeah. So I think we've covered all of the leaders and where they are now. Yep. And maybe in wrap up, we can just talk about a couple of pros and cons that we see with the Brownsville revival. The pros are 
uh, that the gospel mm. was presented. Not every yes. message that we see on YouTube has the gospel presented, but at least they but presented the gospel. Presented. The Bible was open. Much more than at Toronto. Yeah, I was getting ready to the say Bible that. The Bible was open. Yeah, mm. much more than Toronto. Also, people got saved there at the Brownsville Revival. Um, so those are those are some positive things. There's some positive testimonies. Um, but there's also some negatives, too. And yeah. um, so finances is a big one with a, the negatives. Yeah, yeah. They left finance. It was in financial ruin when all of the leaders decided to leave. John Kilpatrick actually states that he was not aware that there were financial issues like there were. And if he had known, he would have stayed on. Mm. Yeah. Another bad, another con uh, of the uh, Brownsville Revival, Revival, and we talked about this in our last video, were the guest speakers that came in and some of the false yes. doctrine that was preached. That's the biggest thing. Yep. I mean, let's, let's put that yeah. on the top of the list because mm -hmm. the false doctrine is the biggest thing. Um, you had people like Cindy Jacobs there. You had, uh, you know, you had uh, David Youngie Cho. Uh, you had um, um, Jensen Franklin. They, just the, the, the way that the leaders um, just kind of uh, put their people, you know, in, in harm's way uh, from yes. false doctrine. So that's that's huge. You're right. It was. Uh, and a lot of negative testimonies. So mm -hmm. we would encourage you to look around YouTube, look at our comments from people who had been there to read the positive and the negative. Yeah. So, folks, this is our Brownsville Revival series. Hopefully the series has been uh, helpful to you. And uh, if it has, and you know uh, of others who might want to watch this series, please just pass the whole series along. We're going to put it in a playlist uh, since it's now completed. Uh, hopefully you'll see that, uh, you know, uh, next time you check our channel out. So thanks for watching, folks.